So Bill Thomas is an exhibit preparator and mount maker at the Natural History Museum of Utah. He has been at the Natural History Museum of Utah since 2009 after working for 15 years in the building trade. A lifelong museum geek. He spent many happy afternoons in his childhood, uh, in his childhood at the Denver Museum of Natural History where his mother worked as a diorama painter. Yeah. So, with that, I'm going to introduce Bill after my really embarrassing moderation. <laughs> I'm sorry, Bill. You did good. You did good. No worries. Hey, thanks so much. I'm uh, really happy and feel rather honored to be here with so many experts in the field and uh, great, great presentations. Um, and I'd like to thank Randy for bugging me every couple of years, getting me out of the shop to come in and talk about our work and, and so on and share it with you. Uh, our director, Sarah, beautifully described the earthquake problem that we have around here. It's not a real shaky place. We don't get them very often, but the threat of a big one is really out there, and most experts say we're overdue for a big one, so we have to be prepared uh, for that. I, there's a great uh, web page called earthquaketrack.com, and it pub publishes the uh, U.S. Geological Survey uh, earthquake information from all around the world, and it's quite updated quite often. It's really, really good real-time stuff. So I look at it a lot. I looked at it yesterday. It said, in the past 24 hours worldwide, there were 84 earthquakes of magnitude 1.5 or greater. In the last seven days, there were 688. In the last 30 days, there were 3,528 earthquakes all over the world. Uh, the biggest ones today, there was one in Tonga, which was a 6.4. There was one in Mexico last month that was 8.1. That's the biggest one of the year. So the whole darn world's an earthquake zone, folks. You know, when one big shaker happens, we feel it all over the globe. So we had one, what, two weeks ago that was a, mag a magnitude three, and hardly anyone even noticed it. <laughs> Nobody felt it. We had no damage. So we're lucky in that regard. But we do have to be ready for the big, the big one when and if it comes. Um, so Sarah also described our new building quite beautifully. When and if it comes, I want to be there. That's the place to be. <laughs> so the smartest thing we've done seismically was our move in 2011 from our old place, which we dearly loved. There's the collections area <laughs> for the paleo folks down in the basement. So they were anxious to get out of there and find something a little better. There's our new home, as you've already seen. And you'll get to visit today. That's great that you're going to come up and see us. I love this picture of the, uh, the uh, past world's gallery under construction. When you go see the building, this will make a lot more sense. Note that the end wall's not even in yet. We had to move those dinosaurs in before the building was complete because they were too big to go through the doors. Okay, and just remember this picture, if you would. The framework around his feet got buried under concrete to hold him down. So when I talk about dinosaurs in a minute, you can remember that picture. Okay, this is the collections area for anthropology in our new building. Big difference. Nice, big, shiny cabinets with doors that close. It's on a rail system where they can squish them together, make uh, lots more room. Everything's protected behind plexi or behind doors or on very tight shelving where it just can't go anywhere. We also have, uh, during our move, an army of volunteers who became cardboard engineers and made lots and lots of storage mounts to hold things very securely on these secure shelves. So um, those guys were amazing. They, they got really good at it, as you can see. These are just some, uh, some baskets, uh, archival cardboard, ethafoam, all the usual materials that I'm sure you're familiar with, moccasins in what they call a milk crate, nice little cardboard carrier, twill tape, and so on to hold them down. Those shelves push back in and the doors close. They can't go anywhere. They're fine. So anyway, we have a huge, huge collection area. This is just anthro. There's another one for paleo, for fossils and minerals, and another one for biology. So we have lots and lots of storage in our new building. 175,000 square feet total, isn't that right? And 100,000 of it is collections, I think. OK, so some pottery. We use what we call a cavity mount, so a big piece of foam with a cavity carved in it, lined with Tyvek, tied down with twill tape. I don't think those guys are going anywhere. And of course, they wouldn't be in the museum if they weren't considered priceless and irreplaceable. So everything gets treated as if it were priceless and irreplaceable. 
because it is. Okay, some of the bigger ones have their own box engineered for them. More ethafoam, more twill tape. Beautifully preserved. We have to guard these forever and ever for all the people of the world. So everybody feels lots better about our, our new collection storage area. Cradle boards. We have a lot of eth ethnography, ethnic art, Native American art. You can see where the big doors close in front of those sliding shelves, and they're tied down, all with archival materials. Not going anywhere. They're in really, really good shape. Okay, these are archaeology items, things mostly recovered from digs or from archaeological sites. Very tight shelving. Notice they can't bounce or travel, go any place. Sorry, that one's sideways, but it shows you the cavity mount, how a fragile piece of basketry is locked down into a cavity mount, secured. <coughs> Same with these uh, ancient corn cobs, really fragile and rare. So they're perfectly safe. Native American jewelry and some fetishes, all in their little pocket mounts and tied down quite securely. The totem pole was on exhibit for the first five years, but he was, I say he, it's actually a they, needed to be removed uh, from uh, light damage and put back in storage for a rest. So the thing's 12 feet tall. We didn't want it going like this back in the storage area. So you can see it's lashed with an enormous nylon strap to a structural part of the building. An enormous, po enormous post in there where he can't tip over, cause damage to other things. <coughs> Okay, let's talk about some of the big stuff out in the galleries. Doesn't get any bigger than the dinosaurs. So you remember the frame I showed you in that first picture. That's buried underneath the concrete. So it's welded down to that frame, packed underneath the concrete. Can't go anyplace. Now the majority of our dinosaurs are casts. So they're a lightweight casting resin formed over a steel frame. Uh, big rods and wires. And we think they're quite structurally sound. So they don't need a lot of support. Some of the older ones, these are made out of plaster, and they still have steel rods inside, and there's often a big plate. This guy got moved from the old building. We had to carry it up there and bolt it down, so it has an enormous steel plate, big bolts drilled down into the concrete, and then concreted over the plate, so it really can't move. The nature of the cast <coughs> allows us to have some fun with these dinosaurs, so this little allosaur you'll see is only anchored by one foot. So he's, he does a little dance like this when the Ventilation blows and he moves. People freak out, think he's falling over. But we figure that's good for at least 200,000 flexes before he's going to cause anybody any trouble. So most of the dinosaurs appear quite unsupported, and they really are. We just count on their internal structure to hold them up. <coughs> there are a couple of exceptions. Our mammoth is made of fiberglass over a steel frame. We moved him from the old building, rebuilt part of the legs to change his posture. And because of the location, he's up on a high precipice. If he ever fell, it would be a catastrophe. So we had some engineers look at it, and they came up with a solution, tying it down with some heavy steel cable. So there's a crisscross between the back legs that will keep him from racking like that and keep him from falling over. <coughs> Again, all drilled deep into the concrete, secured with heavy hardware. You can see the fiberglass skin and the steel structure within. We had to go up through the hole and hook into the structural steel of the mammoth to hold it down. <coughs> Another view of the crisscross cables. So we feel pretty good about that. The head itself is a little bit, is one big chunk. It weighs about 150 pounds. <coughs> and it's just sort of slipped into a socket in the front of the, the, uh, the spine. I don't think it was ever going to jump out. It would have to travel that far. But they insisted that we cable it up to the ceiling, which we did. You can see the, the cable wrap around there and around there. And it goes up around a structural member in the ceiling right there. Very, very strong. Oh, thank you. <coughs> My voice is failing me today. Anyway, so we got some help with structural engineers on that one just because of its special location and the size. It's very tall. OK, another one is Gripposaurus. Our paleo guys have been finding lots of these whole hadrosaurs, a big duck-billed plant-eating dinosaurs. And they had enough of them, they gave us a whole one to put on display. This guy, I think, is about 90% actual fossil material. So they're very heavy. The, the fossil bones are rock. Some of those bones weigh 100 pounds or more. <coughs> so you can see the enormous steel frame we had to put under him, big posts to hold him up, because he's very, very heavy. 
And in the old days, we used to use screws and bolts and stuff to hook bones together to articulate a skeleton. Can't do that anymore. Each bone is an artifact, and we don't want to damage it. <clears throat> so an enormous steel frame was built with lots of little clips put on with screws and bolts to hold it together, so it all has to be clamped to this enormous structure. When you come see us, you'll notice a big difference between this one and all the rest because of all the heavy steel. Anyway, that was a big job to bolt Gryposaurus together. Okay, from big stuff to tiny stuff. What's the danger to little things like this in a flat case if there's a big earthquake? Well, it's probably not going to be damaged, but all of these are individual objects that are numbered and tracked very carefully as to their origin and so on. It could turn all that into a casserole. Somebody would have to sort it all out again. So we, we get around that by putting them in place with little tiny pins as shown here. You drill a small hole into the deck, insert a little wire with a bend in it and hold it down. Hopefully you'll never notice that. That's our object is to, uh, our objective is to make these things almost invisible to most visitors. Okay, these are the famous promontory moccasins that Nancy Odegaard fixed up for us. Uh, what was the way to keep them from rolling around in the event of an earthquake? Are they gonna be damaged? Probably not, but we don't want them to move all around. So we came up with a little tie down that's monofilament covered with a poly suede that matches the color of the leather. Some of them are kind of obvious, but most of them we hope will just blend into the look of the moccasin and not be too noticeable. But they're tied down to plexiglass plates. Those are mounted in the wall. These are sitting on the deck and those are mounted into the structure of the case. So those really can't go anywhere. <coughs> Life gallery, we have some little creatures on display. These are put on little uh, plexiglass plates that are put on posts that are pressure fitted into the plexiglass background. And then the little creatures themselves are tied down to the plates with various pins of all kinds, uh, sometimes monofilament, sometimes little tiny brass wires. There's a weasel butt. <laughs> There's a little tiny wire right there across his tail. <laughs> the tails have a, have a wire structure through them that goes up into the body so we can secure it right there and he's completely tied down. That string right there is just for the little tag that's underneath. Same thing here with a flying squirrel butt. There's a little pin right there and a little piece of monofilament across his tail and some across his front feet so they can't go anywhere. These little guys, little chipmunks, have a a sort of a cradle that holds them onto their frame and then a small top capture that you can't see that holds them onto it. Okay, our textile case. Uh, very fragile, fragile, fragile textiles. The top one is a turkey feather robe. <clears throat> the bottom one is a rabbit fur robe. I believe these are Fremont, is that right? Glenna, are they archaic? No, they're Southwest. They're Southwest, okay. Anyway, several hundred years old. Very fragile. Yeah, 800 years old. Uh, we dreaded having to mount these. We didn't know what to do with them. Anyway, they're put on these <clears throat> slanted boards and they wanted them at a very steep angle for the design. So we had to come up with a sort of a non-slip background and then a way to tie them down. You can't really see it here, but we came up with a series of little, <clears throat> little flat pins that press into the background to hold it down and then we rely heavily on camouflage painting techniques to disguise them. So there you can see them. So now when you come to see us, I've ruined your <coughs> museum visitor experience. You're just gonna be looking for stuff like that on all of our objects. More of them here. Sorry, that's sideways. This is a little bag that could be worn as a backpack. And again, those same little pins holding the top in where it just can't travel, can't go anywhere. Okay, our small mineral cases. I've been to museums where these kind of things are just sitting there. They don't take any precaution whatsoever because they don't really worry about the seismic aspects. Ours look like they're just sitting there, but if you get in close, there are little tiny pins painted to match that hold the minerals in place. So you could have a pretty good shaker and they're not going to move. We got pretty good at painting this stuff to make it disappear. It becomes quite challenging with some of these things. Okay, I'd like to introduce you to our best friend right here. We call this the uh, 
total capture mount or a seismic mount. We were trained in this style by uh, people from the Smithsonian, from the National Museum of the American Indian, uh, back when we started our move. And we made thousands of these things for all of, all of the display objects. So it consists of a support structure. This one's made out of welded brass or soldered brass. Some are welded steel, depending on the size of the object and the strength required. This is a epoxy clay that's sort of smashed into the, around the back of it to give it a good custom fit to the object. A post that's set into the case itself through a pressure fit. We just drill a hole and that fits in it. This one has a rotational catch on it, so two posts where it can't twist. <clears throat> Minerals, sometimes it's hard to find their balance point and make them work on a mount like that. And then the important part is the top capture. This little thing comes over the top of it, locks it in, held in place with a screw. So even if the whole mount shakes, it can't jump off. So we use the turn it upside down and shake it test when making these kind of mounts. They have to survive that. There is the same mount with the clip removed. This one's for a, a green mineral of some kind. That's why the funny color. And then the padding on the, on the uh, support structure to protect the object. <coughs> so it's not right against metal. Okay, another similar mount. This is a uh, sort of a picture frame style, probably for a Green River fossil, which are flat and square. Same mount from the back showing the little removable clips. Same mount with the clips removed. This one's for a, probably for a mammal skull, like a, a, a wolf or some small canine type creature with a post that goes down into the deck, so a vertical mount like this. This would support the under part of the skull, this would support the mandible, and then removable pieces that lock the skull down to the mouth. So these have to all be custom fit, custom painted, and then assembled carefully with screws, then you turn it upside down and shake it before you put it on display. This one, another one for, uh, for the deck mount, this is sideways, this would be the bottom over here sit down into the deck with a top capture to hold the rim. This would be for a pot or a basket. Same thing disassembled. Okay, there's hundreds of these throughout the museum, thousands even. I think we made 2,500 mounts, something like that, when we moved. This is the Kaparowitz case, some big heavy fossils in here. Uh, extensive use of steel mounts because they're so big. You can see one there all made out of welded steel. Same principle, the support structure, and then seismic clips to hold everything together. That's a little blurry, but you can see how complex some of these structures get. Lots and lots of crisscross steel and top clips to hold it together. That's from the front side. That's all the visitors should see is the, the little tiny seismic clips right there holding it in. This is kind of a crummy picture because of the glass, <clears throat> but look for this when you come to see us tonight. Um, this is a partial skull of a Tyrannosaurid dinosaur with the neck vertebrae over here, part of the front jaw out there, the rest of his skull, in about 18 or 19, 20 different pieces. So we had to articulate the skull with the help of some of our paleo guys and build a very complex mount to hold all these tiny pieces <coughs> in the relative position to create this partial skull. That one was very elaborate and took months to finish. This is a baby hadrosaur, baby, baby dinosaur, again, Structural support down here, tied into the steel frame of the case down here, and then a seismic capture there to hold it down so it can't jump. Green River fossils, lots and lots and lots of fossil, fossil fish and plants in our museum. All done the same way with that pressure fit post back into the back of the case and seismic captures where they can't escape. And these are quite fragile and would shatter like a dinner, dinner plate if you dropped them on a hard floor, so we just have to be careful of that. <clears throat> Mineral hall, lots and lots and lots of pressure fit post seismic captures here. So you can see the rotational capture there where the two posts go into the back wall and it can't twist. Seismic top capture right there. Lots and lots and lots of these cases can get kind of stemmy when you, when you have this many mounts on stems. Beautiful, crazy pyrite, big support structure there, seismic capture there. Sometimes they get pretty invisible, you gotta hunt for them. See, like I said, I ruined your, your visitor experience already. You're gonna be looking for that. 
Where did they put it this time? There it is. Another big pyrite. Oop. Support structure there. Seismic capture up there. Some of these are gigantic like that. You can't even touch them without breaking them. So it was a little challenging to build mounts for some of these guys. Crummy picture of the pottery case. Sorry, we're sideways. I just wanted to show you how dense the case is. Try to imagine if something at the top cut loose and fell. Not only would it be destroyed, it would take out several of its friends on the way down, and we don't want that to happen. So again, pressure fit post, structural support there, seismic capture at the top. Same thing here. And we got pretty proud of ourselves with some of the painting. That was kind of fun. <laughs> There's the seismic capture up there. Somebody's favorite coffee mug. I love this piece. Mm -hmm. Again, some of these uh, not only need to be held up, but we needed to give them a little support staying together. So sometimes we put a rim around it like that just to give it a little bit of a, a cradle to support it. You can see this one's been glued back together from shards. A lot of our pottery's like that. And then the top capture up there where it can't escape. Theme and variations here. This one's a post set down into the deck, structural support there, and then a seismic capture here. Keep it from bouncing out. Little tiny seismic capture there. Again, the density of the case, the way they're up high on the wall, have to be extra careful. This could just be a big mess if one of the, one of the ones up high cut loose and came down. But we feel pretty good about, about the security of these, these objects. Same thing with baskets. Um, these are light and don't require a lot of support, but some of them do need structural help. They tend to sag or come apart, so we've done some things there. And we really have fun with baskets because it's easy to hide the tabs. <laughs> Same thing there. Okay, even little tiny things like these lithics. I mean, some of these are like that big. Each one gets its own individual mount all made for it with top capture and little pins held on with screws. So when I say we made thousands of them, a lot of them look like this. They're just little teeny things. These are smoking type pipes carved out of stone. Whoop. Point out the top captures on those as well. More lithics. Okay, our big canyon case, which you will see, uh, or probably have seen in our literature. It's kind of an icon, one of the things people remember about us. This thing's 40 feet high, so if you can imagine something from way up there cutting loose and going bang, 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 all the way down. It'd be like a pachinko game. You just don't even want to imagine it. So we had to be extra careful and put ex extra uh, care into our mount making uh, uh, for this case, which we recently redid, by the way. We rebuilt this whole thing last September. We took everything out, cleaned the glass, put it all back in with a slightly altered design and some change outs on some of the sensitive uh, objects <clears throat> to give them a rest. That was a big job. Okay, so you can see here more fossil fish tied into big steel bars, which then tie into the big steel members of the case. So it's all quite solid. We worried a little bit about how that was going to look, but I don't think the visitors really notice it. Uh, we notice it, but they don't. So again, some sauropod ribs over here with a big iron structure. These rocks are welded to a big steel rod. Uh, and this was one of the best camouflage paint jobs in the whole building. <laughs> Look for that one. I don't even remember who did that, but it's beautifully done. We have lots of these little stone spheres for some reason, a beautiful snowflake obsidian. Um, believe it or not, a sphere is one of the hardest things to make a mount for. It really is tough. You can't grab it anywhere, you know? They're slippery and it's round. So we came up with these little ring mounts, and then they sort of sag. You know, when you have the Easter egg on the spoon, trying to dip it in the thing and it sags. So we put a little gusset in there. It was inspired by the trellis frame on a Ducati motorcycle, actually. We were looking at that thinking, hey, we could do that. And then a little top capture there. So these meet the turn it upside down and shake it standard, believe it or not. Uh, this bowl is up quite high in the case. Yeah, this mount's remarkable for one because of the big seismic capture, the crazy paint job. And then we didn't want to do a plain old pressure fit post, so this is a plate held into the plexiglass of the case with a couple of bolts, just to be extra sure. That one would have not been pretty if it cut loose. Uh, spiky seashell, how do you make a mount for a thing like that? 
anyway, that's, the, that's what we came up with for a seismic capture right there. Baskets, same formula, a ring for support, these arms down here with wide tabs to hold it, seismic capture up here, and again, a lot of fun to do the camouflage paint jobs on these things. And again, you can see the big steel bracketry tying it into the casework, the heavy steel of the case. So pretty, pretty darn strong. Another basket with a big, tall capture on the rim and a crazy paint job. More fossils from the back. You can see our little picture frame mount again with the seismic capture tied into the steel frame of the case, all quite secure. Again, little hidden tabs. If you know where to look, you can spot them. Same thing with a big, big sauropod bone. It's got, you can see the captures around there, a little out of focus, but the same thing applies. We just grab it with bracketry and screws to hold it into place. Hadrosaur footprint, maybe a little bit clunky on the mount, but it's a heavy thing, and then it's got the top capture. Sorry, that's sideways again. All right, well, I'll leave you with that. That's my last picture. That's just a pot shirt, but classic, classic mount with the pressure fit into the post, uh, post, oops, sorry, post into the plexiglass up here, top capture up there, support structure down here, and clever paint job to make it all disappear. Well, that gives you an idea of what we do. I'm glad you're coming up to our house later in the day. We don't know when the big one's coming, but we'd like to think we're ready. No worries. No worries. Does anybody have any questions for, for Bill? Yeah. Um, is the pressure fitting of the rods and the plexi not susceptible to release with vibration? You'd be surprised. We, th we were worried about that, but if you, you use the index drill bits and a caliper and get your your tolerance is just right and then kind of go it doesn't come out on heavy objects more is required and there's a some discussion about that in the mount makers group the guys from the getty are saying it's time for pressure pit posts to go away um, it it could be better probably yeah but for when you look at how many of them we had to do, how, mu how much more work it would be and how clunky the hardware is, we're pretty happy with the way it works right now. Um, I'm curious, um, you must have a lot of low object recommendations. Mm -hmm. so how do you um, um, mount uh, loan objects the same way that you do with the permanent collection or have you come up with systems to make it we feel pretty good about our, our system and our methods. We don't treat loaned objects any differently than the ones that we own. And uh, I guess the registrar could speak more to the paperwork that's involved, but they, we tell them how we're going to do it and usually send them pictures and they're like, yep, looks good. So <laughs> just thinking of a few specific ones that where I was involved that uh, we had to show them our plan and they approved mm -hmm. it. And a second question, um, the boxes in storage that are on the shelves, are those secured down somehow or? Most are just sitting there. Mm -hmm. But the tight nature of the shelving and the doors and so on, even if they moved a little, they couldn't possibly go anywhere or tip over. Any other questions? Yes. I was curious to know what you lined the inside of the mounts with. Uh, we use various materials. There's uh, some nice poly suede that has a sticky back and we cut pieces of that. Or there's the, uh, it's commonly referred to as rabbit tape or volara. That's a polyurethane foam with a sticky back. Those are our two favorites. Sometimes if it's real tight and we don't want to pad it, we'll coat it with a B72 Acryloid or some other archival coating so it's not right against the metal or the paint. Those and are the three th top things right there. And how long did it take you to make all those mounts? Mm, well, let's see. I was hired in October of 2009. We jumped right in and went to work, and the museum opened November of 2011, and we were putting stuff in the night before. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that long. Anything else? All right, well, thanks Anything so much. Else. Enjoy your conference. Look forward to seeing you at the museum. Thank you very much.